All right, it looks like we're live. So welcome everybody to Organism of the Week this week. I hope that you're all having a wonderful morning and that you had a great week last week. And I'm super excited about our topic today because it's something that I just think is really fascinating. Today, we're going to talk about galls. And if you've never heard of galls, here's one right here. So you probably, even if you've never heard about them or knew what they were called, you've probably seen them before. There are these little growths that you'll find on plants. And some, a lot of times you'll find them in just like these weird little lumpy shapes on the stems or the leaves of trees or shrubs. And they grow on all different kinds of plants. And we're gonna talk about where they came from, what they're doing there, and if they're good for the plant or bad for the plant. Sometimes it looks like a plant might be just super infected and dying because you'll find all these weird little lumps all over it. So to start off, what are galls exactly? So a gall is an abnormal growth on a plant. It can be all different sizes or shapes or colors, but it's not a normal thing that the plant will make. It's not a fruit, it's not a flower, it's not a leaf. And it can come sometimes from like a bacterial or a fungal infection in the plant. If some fungus or bacteria gets in the tissues of the plant, the plant might produce a gall. But most of the time, the majority of galls are caused by arthropods. And we say arthropods because it's not just insects. A lot of insects make galls, but also some arachnids, little mites, will make galls. So you can have mites, you can have wasps, um, there are lots of different midges and aphids. Several different types of those little arthropods will make a gall. And usually they have a specific kind of plant that they'll do it with. So one species of midge will like always make galls on a certain species of plant. And the reason that they do it, well actually let's talk about, let's talk about why they, or how they do it first. <laughs> so usually the way that it's done is an insect or a, a mite or a little aphid will come to the plant and it'll either bite it or sting it. And then those foreign chemicals in the saliva of the, of the bug or of the venom of the bug, they get into the tissues of the plant and often there are tissues that are currently growing. They'll do it on like a little leaf bud. You can see that this gall was probably on a little, on a little leaf bud. These little growths that you see here, those are all normal leaf buds. But the insect will bite or sting maybe a leaf bud or a new stem. And when a plant is growing, it makes lots of hormones and chemicals that help tell the plant how to grow, how to make leaves, how what order to put the cells in so that they can grow the right way. When an insect comes along and puts some foreign chemicals in there, whether it's saliva or venom from a sting, those chemicals change the way that those normal plant hormones make the cells grow. So sometimes it'll make the cells get weird and big. Sometimes it'll make the plant make a lot of extra cells. And when that happens, it produces a gall. It's kind of like a tumor um, with cells that have cancer. They, they grow in weird ways, not ways that they would normally grow. And it makes a completely different shape than it's supposed to. So because the plant made the gall, even if the insect like leaves or if the insect dies, the gall will usually stay there on the plant. And so that's why sometimes you can find trees that are just covered in galls. There are some kinds of plants that get galls all the time, like oak trees. This is a little branch from an oak tree. I also have a leaf from an oak tree with some different types of galls on it. And oak trees are just really susceptible to galls. There are over 500 species of arthropods that make galls on oak trees. <laughs> so lots of different kinds that all end up on an oak tree. So the reason that an insect will do this can vary depending on the insect, but a lot of times it's related to getting food. So an insect might sting or bite a plant in order to make this little thing so that it can eat it, or they might sting or bite the plant so that they can have food for their babies. So they'll lay their eggs inside the gall and then as the gall grows, it's like the plant is producing this special food specifically for those baby arthropods, baby insects, the little larvae usually. They can also live inside them, they can be protected. Um, it's a nice little shelter. Some insects will make galls and then stay the winter over inside them 
uh, sometimes like the eggs will hatch in the fall and then the baby insects will just live in here during the winter where they're protected from from snow and cold and storms and then when spring comes and it's warm they'll come out of the galls so this relationship between between the arthropods and the plants it's not symbiosis because even though like the two or it's I should say it's not mutualism both things aren't getting something out of the relationship so they're very closely related to each other the insects can only make the galls on a certain type of plant usually but the plant doesn't get anything out of it in fact the plant is kind of giving something to the insect but it's also not parasitism um, the plant usually isn't negatively affected like even though a little bit of its extra resources are going into producing these galls it's not enough to kill the plant or make it, or make it harder for the plant to survive. Um, so what we call this relationship is commensalism, which is a big word that means a relationship where one animal benefits, the arthropods in this situation, they get food and shelter, and the other organism doesn't get anything or lose anything. They just are kind of there. <laughs> and they're part of the relationship. Without the plant, there would be no galls but they, they aren't being negatively or positively affected. So commensalism is what most of these little gall, insect, or arthropod and plant relationships are. <laughs> so we talked about how oaks have a lot of different kinds of galls. I only have two different kinds here. Um, and most of these galls, I don't know what they're called. I'm not any, any sort of gall expert or anything. I just think they're fascinating. Um, but there are like field guides out there that you can go and identify the type of gall and It can tell you a little bit about the type of insect. I have a couple that I do know that we'll talk about later But for now these little these are just oak galls. That's all I'm gonna call them <laughs> so These ones are growing on the stem. So whatever made them whether it was a wasp or a midge probably bit or stung the stem and then the the oak tree started to produce these so you can see there's some little leaves up there on the top. This is from another oak tree that we looked at just a second ago, but these were made on the leaf, so the insects came up to the, the growing leaf and they bit or stung it. Eventually it will focus. There we go. And so you can see actually, this one right here is completely round. That's what they looked like when I first found these. Um, and then eventually the little insects probably came out um, and that's why they have holes in the top. So usually the, the insects, or it could have been a type of mite possibly, they eat their way out of the gall. And so they'll often have little holes in them. You can see where the bug has crawled out. But there's some examples of leaf galls. Uh, here, these are some of my favorites. Um, this is a stem from a rabbit brush, which is a plant that grows out here in Utah. And all of these weird cottony things that you see are all galls. So this plant had quite a few, quite a few bugs that came and uh, made these little homes for themselves. <laughs> if you look at the top, try to find the best one to show you, and we'll hope that my camera will focus on it. It's a little bit hard to see, but there's a bunch of holes there in the in the top of those galls. And normally rabbit brush has teeny tiny yellow flowers. So if you saw this just out there, you might think that these were some kind of weird flower growing on the stem. But this is not the type of leaf that, that rabbit brush makes, and it's not the type of flower that rabbit brush makes. And so it was made by something else. And in this case, it was some little insects that made these galls. I'm trying to get a good view of those little holes where the insects came out, but it's a bit hard to see. Here's another type of rabbit brush gall. This one's just a straight up cottony ball. <laughs> and there will be like a little hard bit in the middle where the insect would stay inside. Often the egg will be in there and the larva will hatch and it just has like a little, little round home to live inside um, with the, that fluffy protection. <laughs> Excuse me. This one is also really fun. I wish that I'd been able to find a picture of some that were alive, but. I wasn't able to, but this right here is also rabbit brush. Again, rabbit brush seems to have quite a few different um, types of insects that make galls. <laughs> it's 
so hard to see, but you can see that funny shaped little growth there is another type of gall growing on some rabbit brush. Okay, the one that we're gonna talk about for a little bit longer though is big sagebrush. And I realized I should have gotten a picture of what um, big sagebrush looks like up close, but a lot of you, if you live in Utah, you've probably seen it around. We have sagebrush all over the place. Um, and it, it is a really important plant to a lot of different types of insects and animals. But sagebrush, specifically big sagebrush, has 42 different species of midges and aphids that exclusively make galls on sagebrush. So that would be 42 different kinds of galls. And a lot of those midges are all from the same genus. It's called Ro Ropalomia. It's a, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. So this is an example of a gall midge, most likely from the Ropalomia genus. It's, there are so many, there are hundreds of um, types of midges in this little gall midge family. Um, not all of them are in Ropalomia, but there are like somewhere around 200, I wanna say in this genus specifically, and they can be really hard to identify. So even this picture, they weren't entirely sure if it was Ropalomia, but that's most likely what it is, and that's a lot what they look like. So those teeny tiny little gall, or, uh, midges are what produce the galls that we're about to see. Um, but find the right one, here we go. So this right here is a little bit of a branch from a sagebrush, and those funny looking puff balls that you see are galls. They're called medusa galls, and they're made by one of those Ropalomia midges. Um, here's a picture of what they look like when they're alive. I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Loading. <laughs> there we go. So this is some a couple of medusa galls growing on a big sagebrush. And you can see where they get their name from. They look like a little ball of snakes. <laughs> and if you were to look at them up close, they might look like a little bit of like, just a mess of teeny tiny leaves. But you can see right here, the sagebrush leaves look nothing like these little puff balls. Um, sagebrush leaves on big sagebrush have these three little tip, uh, like forked tips. It's like a trident tip on its leaf. <laughs> it's having such a hard time focusing on the leaf. But yeah, so when those little midges are ready to lay their eggs, They'll go up to a sagebrush plant and they'll lay their eggs right underneath the surface of the stem. They'll do it in the tissue of the sagebrush plant. And then when the larvae hatch, usually this is in like the late fall, mid fall, in October or so, the midges will come and, and lay those eggs. And then when the larvae hatch, not long after, they'll start chewing on the tissue of, of the sagebrush and their saliva produces these chemicals that mix with the plant and the plant starts to grow a gall. And this gall will develop before the winter, uh, before the winter hits and the little larvae live inside that gall. And so they're able to spend the winter inside a gall, nice and safe. And when springtime comes, they have metamorphosized into adult wasps, or not wasps, midges. <laughs> um, some wasps will make galls as well, but in this case, it's midges. <laughs> and so the midges will crawl out of the galls and fly away and live their little midge life. And then in the fall, they lay their eggs again and it starts all over with new galls on new sagebrush plants. But it's always with a sagebrush plant for this species. And they'll always look like these little balls of snakes, <laughs> Medusa galls. Here's a couple of other types of sagebrush gall. Um, this one right here, these look like funny little flowers just growing on the top of a plant, but sagebrush flowers are tiny and yellow and they grow in bunches. So these right here, you can see the leaves don't look like sagebrush leaves either. <laughs> and if you look at the middle of them, they're really fuzzy, just like that fuzzy um, rabbit brush gall that we saw earlier. So these are also really funky galls. I wasn't able to find what the name of them are, but they're most likely made by that same genus of gall midge, which is the genus that makes most of the galls that grow on sagebrush. And then we also have this one that's very different. It's also on a sagebrush and it's really small and dried out. So it's a little bit hard to see, but it looks a lot like a little mushroom. It was a bit flat when I found it last summer. Um, and then it dried out and got sort of wrinkly, but this is also from a sagebrush. You can see that 
really funky shape. And just like the other ones, the, the little arthropods will live in the inside of the gall and then eat their way out at some point. All right, so even though the gall is like a nice safe place for, for the insects to live, or arthropods, <laughs> it's not always completely safe. There are actually some kinds of wasps that they don't make their own galls, but they'll go up to galls and they'll inject their eggs into the gall, and then the wasp larvae will hatch inside the gall and eat the midges or aphids or whatever has made the gall out of the gall. <laughs> so they don't have to produce the chemicals to make their own gall, they just use other animals' galls, other, um, other bugs' galls. <laughs> there are also some kinds of insects that will like crawl around on the plants and find galls, and they'll eat the galls, they'll eat the things out of the galls. Galls have a lot of like chemicals and proteins, and um, because the plant has like produced this extra growth, a lot of time there's good pro like good healthy protein in there for for insects and even for other animals. Sometimes, so we mentioned that the galls will usually like stay on the plant even after the insect leaves, but they don't always stay on forever. A lot of times they'll fall off, just like a leaf will fall off after a little while. Um, and so like after they've fallen off, sometimes they'll be scattered on the ground, and birds will come and like pick them up from the ground and they get that extra plant protein. So they're really useful for a lot of other animals besides just the arthropods that made them. I have a picture of another uh, insect that makes galls. This is a, oops, I left the wrong genus on there. It's not Ryopalm, Ro Ropalmia or whatever the other one was called. <laughs> but this is a, a gall making psyllid. So you can see, um, it looks a little more like an aphid. It's called a psyllid. And these guys will also go up and bite a leaf of a plant. So this is from a plant called hackberry. It's a really wrinkled up couple of like five leaves all wrinkled up on the end of the stem here. But if you look at it, you can see all those little galls sticking off. This is another, might be a little easier to see on there. There we go. So there's quite a few galls on there, like a, a dozen or more, all on this one little leaf. And these are actually called hackberry nipple galls, which some galls have really weird names, and this is one of them. <laughs> but it's another one that you can find around here in Utah. This one was actually, I think that I might have found this one here on BYU campus. I can't remember for sure. No, I did. Over by the Life Sciences Building. If you're ever on BYU campus, um, there was a hackberry tree over there. And it had these little, uh, these little galls all over the leaves. So the midges will lay their eggs just like the or the psyllids will lay the eggs just like the midges we were talking about earlier. Um, but instead of doing it on the stem, they do it on the leaves. And then those baby psyllids are able to eat their way out of, out of the leaf. <laughs> all right, so that was the last one that I had for today. I hope that you guys all learned some cool stuff about galls. I think they're really fascinating. And maybe now that you know more about them, you'll be able to go out and keep an eye out for, for galls on the plants that you see around. And remember, they're not dangerous to the plant. You don't have to worry about, about uh, them killing your gardens or anything like that. Um, and actually, if you tried to spray them with like a, a pesticide or something to get rid of them, it usually doesn't work because the galls are such a good protect protection for those baby arthropods. So as long as there aren't too many of them, your plants are probably okay. And it's a great way for all of the insects that provide food for other animals to grow and Keep their life cycles going. <laughs> so I'll see you guys next week. I hope that you have a wonderful one and we'll talk to you later. Bye!